We're continuing our message series called Sunday Classics, and this is sort of our summer series. We've taken a couple weeks off. We did a special message on July 4th and then had a guest speaker last week, but we're back into our series, and we'll continue this through Labor Day, and we're just kind of taking some of those classic Bible stories. Some of them you might know really well, some of them maybe not as well, but looking at those, these these old stories, these stories of the faith, and just trying to make application to, uh, to our lives today. And I thought a lot of these stories, not all of them, but a lot of them sort of have kids' songs to them, uh, Sunday school songs. Today we're going to look at a story that has probably one of my favorite little kids' songs. I'm not going to sing it for you, um, but I, I, I was thinking this morning I should have I had Jason lead it. Um, but the song talks about 12 guys that go and spy out a land. And so we're going to begin this morning in Numbers chapter 13. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So right at the beginning of the Bible in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 13. Verses 1 and 2 says this. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan which I am giving to the children of Israel. For from each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. And so the nation of Israel, God's people, had been enslaved in Egypt. God provided salvation or this exodus through the leadership of a man named Moses. And they, they came out of Egypt after, after plagues, uh, ravaged the land. God parted the Red Sea for them to go across. God provided water from a rock. He made bitter water sweet. He, he rained down manna upon these people. And he brings them to the edge of the Jordan River, to a place uh, on the other side called Canaan, that the, the the place that the Jews referred to as the promised land. It was promised to them from God. And in Numbers chapter 13, in verse number one, God says, I want you to go spy a land that I will give you. He doesn't say, you should go check out this land and see what you think, see if you ought, if you ought to go there or not go there, Rather, he says, you need to go explore a thing that I'm going to give you. If you come to my house any time between the day after Thanksgiving and not before, or up until Christmas Eve, you will see in our living room a Christmas tree. It's, it'll be all decorated. Uh, there's many other Christmas decorations throughout our home. But there at the Christmas tree, uh, we've got a, a tree skirt. Um, that's something that I now know what it is because uh, I have a wife and two daughters. And around the tree is a train. But from the day after Thanksgiving until Christmas Eve, one thing you won't find under the tree is presents. Not because we don't give presents. We do exchange presents in my house. Now, I'm a big fan. But the tradition within our house is we don't put any of the gifts under the tree until Christmas Eve. And you would think that there might be some spiritual reason for that or uh, maybe some kind of uh, family tradition, but uh, apparently the lineage of that is that I like to guess presents. And one year, as my wife tells it, I, I guessed them all right. And she did not find that to be an enjoyable thing. But I, you know, I kind of shake them, weigh them, squish them. And I'd be like, this is a shirt. And I'd unwrap it and it'd be a shirt. And I'd be like, I was right. And she, that was not fun for her. So she hides all of the presents. We, we, we also have a tradition. My wife buys for everybody, and I just buy for my wife. So um, that's how we divide the shopping up. 
Um, it's according to strength. If she could buy for her, she'd be better off, trust me. But everything that I buy for her, I hide. Not real sneaky about it. I hide it out in my shop. She probably knows it's there, but she stays away because she likes the mystery of a present. I know that she hides our presents in her office, but I respect her wishes and usually don't go in there most of the time. (laughs) But God said to the nation of Israel, here's your gift. Shake it. Look at it. Matter of fact, it's not even wrapped. Go check it out. Go spy out the land that I will give you. And so there's 12 tribes of Israel. They pick a guy from every tribe, a leader. We know that one of the guys, and we're going to talk about him today, was a guy named Caleb, and we know that he was 40 years old. This was a guy who had been an adult slave in Egypt. He had seen all that God had done. And so presumably, his peers, the other spies, were of similar age and experience. And if you know the story, they go into the land. They say it's a land flowing with milk and honey. They cut, and the Bible says, a single cluster of grapes, and they haul it on a a pole, a stick, between two guys. That's how big it is. They bring back other fruits, and and the, the people are amazed at the size and the quality of the produce that is produced there. But the report also has some cautions. In Numbers 13 and verse 26, it says, They departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell in the sea and along the banks of Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Caleb says, let's go. But 10 guys are like, pump the brakes. The cities aren't just villages that we can march on. They're walled, fortified cities. There's giants in the land. These people are big, they're strong, they're powerful, they're organized, And we're a band of people, former slaves, wandering around. We're not ready to fight. And we can't fight these people. We can't overcome them. And the people responded. In Numbers 14, beginning in verse 1, it says, All the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night. 
And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Let us go back and be slaves. That is, their, that is what they're saying. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephna, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. We get a glimpse here. There were 12 spies and two of them, Joshua and Caleb, the men we're looking at today, they gave a good report. In Numbers 13, we read Caleb's report. And Caleb says, let's go. God can give it to us. Let's go up right now. Let's take this land. In Numbers 14, we get a little bit of an understanding of why he said what he said. Because he said, if God is with us, if God gives us the land, God's not going to protect these people. Their protection has been taken away. God is going to give it to us. See, Caleb's reliance, Joshua's reliance wasn't, yeah, those people are big, but I'm tough. Yeah, I mean, those cities are strong, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great warrior. It wasn't confidence in themselves. It was confidence in God. But the people didn't believe that report. They said, you know what? We're tired of fire, following Moses and Aaron. We need to pick another leader who's going to take us back to Egypt. We'd be better off. I don't want my children to be orphaned. I don't want my wife to be widowed. And if we go in and try to attack and take what God has promised to us, we're going to die. And they thought, while we're at it, why don't we just kill Moses and Aaron and Caleb and Joshua? And God prevented that. And then God brought a judgment. In verse 23 and 24 of Numbers 14, they certainly shall not, God is speaking, and he says, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. We're going to see the spirit of Caleb here in a few minutes, but I love what God says about him. He has a different spirit. This guy, Caleb, he's not like everybody else. He's different. But because he gave a good report, him and Joshua will see the land, but none of these other guys will. Verse 36 says, Now the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation complain against him by bringing a bad report of the land, those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephna remained alive of the men who went to spy out the land. And if you know the story, for 40 years... The nation of Israel wandered in the desert, in the wilderness, until an entire generation of people died. Immediately, the 10 spies who gave an evil report, they died by a plague. 
But Joshua and Caleb watched as all of their peers died. And only they were left for God to bring them into this promised land. So a couple of lessons I want us to look at this morning. Number one, they doubted the promise of God. God had been clear. In Numbers 13, he said, go spy the land that I'm going to give you. He wasn't, he wasn't sneaky about it. He wasn't trying to surprise them. He wasn't saying, well, check it out. Let's, let's strategize about whether it's a good idea or not. He said, I'm giving you this land. And it wasn't the first time that he had promised this. All the way back to Abraham and Isaac, he would say, wherever you walk, this is the land that I'm going to give you. Even when they were in Egypt, as God freed them from slavery, they knew where they were going because God had promised them a land. They knew where they were going. They get there, and God says, we're to the place where the gift is. Go check it out. But all they could see was the obstacles. You ever talk to somebody, they're facing a situation, and all they can see is the obstacles? They can't see the good things? I've referenced this before, and I do enjoy, uh, listen, I, I like to, to, to help people through situations as a pastor. That's what I want to do, and, and, and I counsel people, but I'm not, I don't have the gift of counseling. I'm just telling you. I, I think if, if I weren't a pastor, I think I'd be a mechanic. Something breaks, you pull that part out, put a new part in, it runs. That's sort of the, you know, like I, couple comes in, they're fighting, I'm like, well, here's your problem. Fix it, have a great day. And I realize it's often, it's, it's often more complicated than that. My wife will tell you, he's a simple man. But here we have this group of people and God has promised them something. But all they can see is the obstacles. And sometimes that's the way we are. We can only see the negative. We can only see the obstacles. And in that, we lose sight of the promise of God. The most important part of the whole thing is God promised to give them the land. They were just going out to, yeah, they were going to spy it out, make a plan, see what they were getting. But God had already determined the outcome. He had already made a promise. But they lost sight of God's promise. They didn't believe. They doubted. And they continued in the same pattern of unbelief. They lifted up their voices and they say, why are we here? Why did God bring us out here to kill us? Yeah, that was God's plan. He sent a bunch of plagues so that you could leave Egypt. Then he parted the Red Sea so you could walk across on dry land. When the army of Egypt came in, he closed, so he killed them and gave you a great victory. Then he brought you to a place where there was bitter water. He made that water sweet. You went to a place where there was no water. He brought water from a rock. Took you to another place where you, you had nothing to eat. He sent manna down from heaven, all to get you to this place so he could kill you. It's absurd. It, in the same way, it's absurd to think that God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you, to forgive you of your sins, to secure for you eternal life in heaven. But in this circumstance that you're dealing with right now, he's not, he's not concerned about that at all, and he's turned his back on you. Those are equally absurd. But sometimes we feel that way, don't we? Sometimes we feel like God has abandoned us. Sometimes we feel like God is uncaring in our circumstances. I'm not trying to minimize 
the circumstances that you're in. I don't even want to minimize the circumstances that the nation of Israel was in. These were people who were slaves. They probably had very limited weapons. They had no training or experience. I mean, they, didn't, they couldn't look at a guy and say, well, he was a general or he fought. No, they didn't have any of that. All of the people that they had were slaves. Now, if you wanted bricks baked and pyramids built, these were your guys. But if you were going to fight wars, you're in trouble with this crew. But God promised them the land. But they had a pattern. Every time things got tough, every time circumstances seemed insurmountable, they said, we can't trust God. We should just go back to Egypt. You read that. You think about that. It seems absurd. To be enslaved rather than free? To go back to under the thumb and oppression of Pharaoh rather than to be in the protection and the blessing of God Almighty? God literally led them by his very presence, a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by the day. And yet every time they faced a difficulty, we had to go back. Kind of like every time we face a difficulty, we decide how we can handle it in our strength. We try to figure out how we can be smart enough or cunning enough or whatever it is to work those things out. Maybe that's not your problem. It's often mine. I had to learn that. I, well, I'm still learning it. Man, I can think of so many times. Situation would come up and I'm like, I'll handle it. And I jump the gun and don't give God a chance to work. Why? Because I have a pattern. Because I often want to rely on myself. My pride gets in the way. And you know what? Most of us have a pattern. When faced with difficulties, we'll do something that is not trusting in God. Maybe we get angry, maybe we get sad, maybe we retreat, maybe we attack, but what we don't do is what we should do. The nation of Israel did it, and we do it. I put several verses, but man, if you read the second, the second half of the book of Exodus, over and over again, it's like, why are we out here? Is God going to kill us? We ought to go back to Egypt. Egypt, listen, Egypt sucked. Say, well, I don't know that you ought to use language. I, it just, that's what it was. It was horrible. They were slaves. But it seemed better than what they were facing. Let's make a little bit of application. Just a couple of things. Number one, God can be trusted. That's a pretty simple statement. But if you apply that statement to your life, that has pretty major consequences. That has radical consequences. God can be trusted. Think about even as Christians. I don't know your circumstance, but for, for a lot of us, we come to Christ and we, we have an understanding about the issue of salvation. And that's, that's really the first step being born again, Jesus called it in John chapter three. Being born into God's family. And so we recognize that we are flawed individuals. We're sinners, is the, the Bible word. And one sin makes us a sinner. Well, we've all lied or thought about lying. We've all lost our temper. We've all had hate in our heart, whatever it is, unforgiveness, 
bitterness. We sin. We're sinful people. And we recognize that that separates us from God. And we can't be good enough to get to God's standard. God's standard is holiness. Now, you might be a, you might be a great person. You might look around this auditorium and say, I am better than 99% of these other people. But you're still not holy. None of us get to God's standard. It's not about being better than the person next to you. It's about being holy. And since we can't be holy and we can't get to God, God came to us in the form of Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life. He died a death he didn't deserve. On the third day, he rose again to show his power over sin and death. And then he offers to us forgiveness and salvation. He said, if you'll just believe in me, if you'll put your trust in me, I'll forgive you and I'll give you eternal life in heaven. And when we take that step of faith, we're born Again, we're born into God's family. And we may not realize it at the time, but do you realize what we're trusting God with? We are trusting God with our eternal destiny. With eternity. That's a big deal. And we take that step of faith, but then it's hard to trust God sometimes with seemingly smaller things like our relationships or our money or our standards of, of how we conduct ourselves in, in business or, or in our, our romantic relationships. There's all kinds of areas in which all of the sudden following God's standards seems pretty radical. But God can be trusted. He can be trusted with our eternity. He can be trusted with our relationships. He can be trusted with our money. He can be trusted with our time. He can be trusted with our career. He can be trusted with our children. He can be trusted with every part of our life. God doesn't fail us. But oftentimes, trusting him can be difficult. My, probably my favorite part of this whole story is found in Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 1, Moses has died. The leader, God had told him that he wasn't going to be able to go into the promised land. And God comes to Joshua, one of the two spies who gave a good report, and he says, you're going to be the new leader. And in Joshua chapter 1, you read that over and over. He tells Joshua, be strong, be courageous, be strong, be courageous. Because what you have to do is difficult. And the first thing that he had to do was lead the the whole nation of Israel across the Jordan River to the city of Jericho, this walled city. And you know the story. They marched around. The walls came down. God brought a great victory. They're now pushing into the promised land, and as they go, they're dividing it. They're giving to the different tribes their inheritance. They're saying, this is for you. And in Joshua chapter 14, the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, verse 6, and Caleb, the son of Jephna the Kinzonite, said to him, to who? Joshua. Here comes Caleb. His old friend Joshua. They stood out in the crowd. Not a lot of old guys walking around. But Joshua and Caleb. They had known each other for years. They remembered that trip through Canaan, and now they're back. Listen to what Caleb says. You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me, 
in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot is trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because now, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. What Caleb told Joshua, Joshua already knew. He said, Remember when we took that trip? Of course, Joshua remembered. Remember how 10 guys gave a bad report, but I gave a good report. Joshua was like, yeah, I know, so did I. I was there. But remember how God spoke to Moses and he promised that I would be able to come in and possess the land. Remember Joshua? Of course Joshua remembered. And then Caleb said this. In verse number 10. Now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. And as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. I am as tough as I was 45 years ago. That's what Caleb says. He says, I'm 85 years old. I was ready to go to war when I was 40, and I'm ready to go to war now. And then he says this. Give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great, and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out <clears throat> as the Lord said. So Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephna, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephna, the Kinzonite, to this day because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. If you would, put verse 12 for me back up. Can you put verse 12 of that passage? He says this, give me this mountain. You heard in that day how the Anakim were there. Who's the Anakim? Remember what we read? They were the giants. And what does he say? The cities were great and what? Fortified. Now, if I'm Caleb, I'm like, look, all you young bucks, I'm 85. See that valley where there's just a few villages? I'll take that. I'll take what's easy. You go take what's hard. But Caleb had a different spirit. Caleb was a man who wholly trusted God. So he said, hey, Joshua, you know that mountain where the giants are? You know where the cities, the walls are extra thick and the soldiers are extra tough? Can I have that? Because I've been waiting for 45 years and I'm ready. Man, I love the heart of Caleb. But I love his faith and his trust in God. Paul writing to Titus in Titus 1 2 says this In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. If we believe that God can be wholly trusted, if we believe that his word is true, and that every word of God's Bible can be trusted for our own lives, shouldn't that have a radical consequence for the way that we live? 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says this, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, 
as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, the primary meaning of this verse relates to salvation. But he says this, don't think God doesn't do what he said. Because here's the thing about God. He doesn't lie and he can be trusted, but sometimes his timing isn't the most convenient. Sometimes his timing isn't the way we would do it. You know, wouldn't it be nice if we could get across the Red Sea before we even really could see the armies of Egypt? And then we'd know that there was a nice barrier and we'd never be worried about it. Wouldn't it be nice if instead of bringing water from a rock because we're thirsty and we're afraid that we're gonna die, we just rolled up on a beautiful lake and we could just enjoy the water right then? See, oftentimes God puts us in desperate situations, in difficult circumstances. Because it's in those situations that he shows himself mighty. It's in those situations that his power can be clearly seen. Otherwise, we might just think, we really know what we're doing and, and we found the lake. Or we're really smart and we've out, outfoxed the Egyptian army. But God is not slack concerning his promise. His timing may not be what you think, but God always does what he says. Jesus Christ ascended into heaven and, he, and the angel said in Acts chapter one, in the same manner in which he went, he's going to return. But it's been 2,000 years. And there's people that look around and say, well, I guess that's not gonna happen. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He's long-suffering. You know why Christ hasn't returned yet? Because he wants to see more people repent and turn to him. Amen. That's what it says. He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if God is worth believing and trusting in for our eternal destiny, then he's worth believing and trusting in each and every day of our life. And so I would, I would just challenge you, first of all, with this. Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? Has there been a place and a time in your life when you have asked Christ to forgive you of the wrong things that you've done and you've put your faith and your trust in him? Not, are you going to church? Do you read your Bible? Are you trying to be good? None of those things are gonna make you holy. None of those things are gonna make you good enough to be accepted by God. The only thing that is good enough to be accepted by God is Jesus. And his blood covers us. His forgiveness comes to us. God provides grace through him. John chapter 3 and verse 16, you've heard it before, but it says, for whosoever, excuse me, for God so loved the world. Maybe I've not heard it before. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All we have to do is believe. We have to trust. And so, the first thing that I see is that God can be trusted. And then the other application I want you to think about today is that our faith encourages others. As you live out your trust in Jesus Christ, that is a tremendous encouragement to others. Think about this generation. They saw all that God did in bringing them out of Egypt, performing all of these miracles, and yet they were a doubting generation. They died off. 
and you had this younger generation coming up. They had never been slaves. They had only been homeless. I mean, they had just wandered around the desert. But they had Joshua, and they had Caleb. Men who told them what God had done. Men who led them to follow after God. And men who primed them and helped them to understand what God was going to do. And God began to build that generation's faith. And this is what Scripture says about the influence of Joshua in Joshua chapter 24. Verse 29, it says, Now it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. They buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnath Sarah, which is in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gaash. Joshua died in the promised land in the very inheritance that God had given him. But then it says this, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Not only did God use Joshua and Caleb to lead the nation of Israel to to get the promised land, But their testimony outlived them. They they inspired an entire generation to trust and follow and serve God. Oh, that we would have that kind of faith. I've mentioned this before. God's given me three, my wife and I, three kids. We don't have any grandkids. I'm looking forward to that day. There's no doubt I'm looking forward to being a grandfather a lot more than I ever looked forward to being a father. Not because I didn't like being a father, but I just didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. But now I'm thinking about being a grandpa. I'm I'm excited for that. I'm just, I mean, I'm gonna spoil kids. It's gonna be great. They're not gonna be great. They'll probably be brats, but I'm gonna have fun. That's my kid's problem, right? But you know what I'm doing now? I'm praying for my grandkids. Just like I pray for my kids. That they would love and follow Jesus Christ. If if God would grant me anything, it's that I could be an example of faith that would inspire my children and my grandchildren. And God used Joshua and Caleb in that way. And you have no idea how God will use you to be an example of faith to others. See, it doesn't happen when we intend to be an example of faith. Think about the stories in Scripture. The poor widow woman who brought just a couple of pennies and that was all she had. She didn't go that day and offer that offering thinking, I know Jesus is going to use me as an example. Of course not. Matter of fact, if you read that story, it says that men would come and they would make a great big show of the gifts that they would give, but not this widow woman. She came quietly and humbly and offered what she had, and Jesus used her as an example of faith. That's how it happens. Not when we try to impress somebody else, when we just try to follow and trust Jesus. I want to close this morning with this passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. Beginning in verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting or encouraging, building one another up, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You realize when we come together, when we gather as an assembly, as a church, it's not just to hear what the preacher has to say. A big reason we gather together is to encourage one another to good works. To build one another up. Sunday is not a day in which I minister and you minister too. Sunday is a day in which we are to minister to one another. Preaching and the declaring of, of the truth of God's word is part of that. But it's not, it's not even I, I, the, the biggest part. When we, we should be more and more about encouraging one another. About building one another up. He says we ought to, we ought to as we see God approaching more and more, we ought to be involved in this, not less and less. Your faith can encourage others. And so my challenge to you this morning is, what is God challenging you to do? For some of you, maybe today, you need to take that step of salvation. You need to pray and ask God to forgive you of the wrong things that you've done. You need to repent of those things and put your trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've taken that step of faith, but God is calling you to be baptized. You haven't publicly identified with Jesus Christ through the ordinance of baptism. Maybe God's calling you to be involved in service in some way. Maybe he's calling you to give in some way. I don't know what God is speaking to you about, but I know that God challenges us in our faith. Will we trust in him? Will we follow the example of Caleb and Joshua and believe what God has promised and trust and live in him? Let's bow our heads this morning. Our gracious God, we thank you for your word. Your word that, that challenges and inspires us. God, I thank you for the example of Caleb and Joshua, men who didn't see the obstacles. They didn't only see the giants and the walled cities, but God, they saw the promise and the present that you had given to them. And God, you allowed them to see the fulfillment of that promise when others were, were, were lacking in their faith. God, help us to be inspired. Help us to be men and women who walk in that same faith. Give us the courage and the faith to believe you in our daily lives, to walk in ways that are pleasing to you and according to your word. God, we love you today. Thank you for your word. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.